The date is November 19, 1937. Outside 209 North Street, an anxious crowd lines up beneath a radiant neon glow. Inside, a projectionist threads up Double or Nothing, a Bing Crosby and Martha Ray musical comedy. This night, the community will discover a cultural and architectural treasure, the normal theater. People didn't have money and they didn't have a lot of outlets for entertainment like they do today. So going to the, going to the theater to see a film was a big event. And the, the people that ran these theaters knew that and, and they promoted them that way. They always made it a big event with, with very ornate structures and, and, and lots of activities going on. Usually families made an entire day of it almost, or at least an entire evening. They would come in and, and have dinner or, or uh, go get a soda at the soda fountain and uh, take in a movie and then maybe go out afterwards. It was a, it was a big event. It was an exciting event. Uh, you can sit at home now and watch uh, video with your family. It's not the same as going to a theater and sitting in a crowd listening to their uh, laughter or crying or whatever happens in a dark theater that's an experience while other area movie theaters of the era were simply converted vaudeville houses the normal was to be a facility solely designed for sound films boasting such state-of-the-art features as air conditioning and a high fidelity sound system the Normal provided movie audiences with the latest in technological advancements. Arthur Moratz, a Bloomington architect, designed the theater. The architect's Art Deco, Art Moderne design was, by 1937 standards, sophisticated, if not radical for a small central Illinois community. The double-stepped front facade of the building was embellished with alternating wide and narrow bands of a glass-like material called vitrolite. These bands contrasted with the ivory-colored stucco of the building. Vertical strips of black and red vitrolite extended from above the marquee to the top of the front facade on either side of the curved top sign tower. The word normal was spelled out in powder white neon tubing on the tower. Projecting from the front of the building was a marquee with rounded corners and trimmed in a corrosion-resistant metal called Monel. The front and sides of the marquee were lit with multicolored neon lighting. The underside was adorned with exposed incandescent bulbs. The ticket booth, located in the center of the theater front and below the marquee, featured accordion-pleated Monel with black vitrolite curved window frames. The interior of the 45 by 100 foot building included a lobby, a ladies lounge, gents smoking room, and a 620 seat auditorium. Seats were coral in color, with plush backs and leather bottoms. The walls were stenciled, and rugs, drapes, and lighting fixtures repeated the Art Deco motif. If you go back to a lot of the early big motion picture palaces, the ones people normally think of for restoration, the great Lowe's chain with the marble fountains and staircases and so on. They really were modeled after uh, stage theaters with different kinds of viewing demands. But here you have a theater from a later period, from the late 1930s, that not only has the simpler Art Deco style of decoration, but along with that, a simplicity in, aud in auditorium design, where essentially you have that long, narrow space. So it really is a far superior space for viewing the films than are some of the grand old movie palaces which have been restored around the country. It's not like going to the theaters at the malls where, you know, it's basically just a box. There was some thought put into this. There was some, there was some real soul put into this building. And uh, even despite its present condition, which we hope improves, it's, uh, it's got some romance to it. It's, it's got some, it's got a soul. The theater was financed by Sylvan and Ruth Kupfer, a local lawyer and his wife. The Kupfer family had previously developed the Scenic Theater in Bloomington. Kupfer raised the $100,000 required to underwrite the project. He then leased the theater back to the public's Great States Corporation, a subsidiary of Balaban and Katz, a Chicago theater booking agency. Sylvan Kupfer retained the position of manager. 
originally the Kupfers decided what films would be shown. But they didn't have a lot of experience in that, but Belden and Katz did. There was a point at which there was controversy over what films were selected for the theater. There was a point in time when somebody in the uh, Chicago decided that this was too far south to show certain movies. And there was a little controversy over, oh yes, you can show it. This is a college town. It's a pretty open-minded town. And pretty soon they realized this and they started showing more of the really current films. As time went on, the theater became less economical to run because you didn't have, you only had one set of seats, only one film to show under one roof. However, there was always a problem when you had a film that was such a blockbuster that the little theaters had to show it for months just to get all the people in who wanted to see it because they had much less seating. And so a lot was made of the fact that the normal theater had a really large seating capacity compared to the others. In December of 1974, the Normal Theater was sold by Great States Theaters to Carasotis Brothers Theaters, a Springfield-based company. The new era of theater megachains would place financial stress on the Normal, as well as many other independent movie houses like the Irvin and Castle Theaters in Bloomington. On March 19, 1982, the Normal began showing $1 movies. Absence of Malice, starring Sally Field and Paul Newman, kicked off what was to be a seven-year reduced-price admission policy at the theater. What do you want? Where'd the story come from? In early 1985, however, Carasota's Normal Theater would undergo a conversion, becoming the Normal Theaters 1 and 2. While the theater's original screen would remain intact, a wall was constructed across the theater's width at the beginning of the balcony section. Seating capacity, originally reported to be 620, would be reduced to 198 for Theater 1 and 160 for Theater 2. Besides reducing the seating capacity to 358, a second projection booth was added and a new access corridor was carved from what had been the original ladies' lounge, linking the lobby with a new Theater 1. When they cut it in half, that was a pretty bad feeling. It was almost like you didn't, it took me a long time to just go in and see a movie at it when they, at the theater when they split it. It was a strange feeling that, almost a sickening feeling. And one time my daughter was home from Chicago and there was a movie, I think it was uh, that one about Mozart, that Amadeus, that we both wanted to see and it was at the normal theater. And she was saying, oh, I can't go, I can't go in there and see it. Well, I said, well, you gotta, sometime you got to do it. And so we did, and it kind of broke down the barriers, and it was okay, although you were way too close to the screen and one half of it. But yeah, it was, it was tough. In November 1989, the normal returned to a first-run full admission policy, but reverted to $1.50 a seat bargain shows a year later. Attendance continued to drop at the normal, though, due in part to the expansion of Carasota's Cinema 5 in 1985 and the construction of the eight-screen Parkway Cinemas in 1990. On May 16, 1991, the normal theater's silver screen would fade to black with the final showing of that night's features, The Doors and Kindergarten Cop. A movie-going era that had begun 54 years earlier had ended. I'm very happy to be here. First, I would like to just get to know you. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. Quiet. On September 16, 1991, the Normal City Council acted to save the Normal Theater from an uncertain future. The theater was designated a historically significant structure. Eventually, the town of Normal would negotiate to buy the movie house from GKC Theaters in November of 1991. It was now time for the Normal Theater to make its encore. We wanted to see the building preserved, and we wanted to see it pre preserved as a movie theater. And quite frankly, we were concerned that, that there was simply no one available willing to step forward to do that. We even talked to a few people locally, including Illinois State University to find out if they might be interested in buying the building and continuing to use it as a movie house. Um, everybody thought it was a great idea and expressed some interest, but they weren't interested enough to commit dollars to the project. 
Um, and it was that time that, in fact, it was Mayor Harmon who had a, a telephone conversation with uh, Mr. Carasotis himself and indicated the town's interest in saving that building. And it was that point that uh, George Carasotis suggested, well, if the town's so interested in saving this old building, why don't they buy it? Before we bought it, we checked that building out thoroughly. We had uh, our own building inspection staff uh, go through the building and, and check for code violations or obvious problems with the building. We brought in an architect and had the architect look at the building. We brought in a local building contractor and had that individual go through the, the structure. So we checked it out pretty thoroughly before making the decision to buy it and we were felt comfortable that we were aware of most of the building deficiencies. And, and quite frankly, there weren't many. It has cosmetic problems, but those are things we can address. Um, the, the big expensive items like foundation work and roof repair and those kinds of things really weren't an issue for us to deal with. The Normal Theater Restoration Project brings together individuals from the public and private sectors, transforming the normal from a deteriorating movie house to a unique community centerpiece. The theater's transformation will represent more than restoring a piece of the past. It will enhance economic development in Normal's downtown. Well, I think that a lot of communities have seen uh, many buildings torn down. That uh, Probably in a lot of cases that was justified, but in some cases buildings that maybe had some structural soundness to them were destroyed because of expansion or new development. You know, here's an opportunity for us to take a building that can be restored and, and be put to a use. And uh, from that use, we can, we can uh, garner some revenue to support the maintenance of the building in the future. And it will not be the kind of a building that would have to be subsidized by any public tax dollars or those kind of things. Uh, and then we can also encourage the use of it, which will generate economic activity for the downtown area. I think it's important uh, not only to save buildings and structures like this. Uh, I think we all realize that that's important. Uh, but I think it's also important to the downtown normal merchants and that it will bring a lot of new people into the downtown area that have probably never shopped here before. Uh, they may not stop and shop right on the spot, but uh, hopefully they'll re remember the businesses they see down here and come back to shop for Christmas or whatever. But we feel that the normal theater will be like having a year-round promotion in downtown normal. Should be, bring new people in constantly. Uh, I think that's one of the more exciting parts about the whole project is the number of people have said, yes, I want to be involved with that opportunity. I want to be involved with that activity. I want to be involved with the theater restoration. Uh, and the memories that they have. My gosh, we've had people in their uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s talk about their first dates at the theater, all the way down to uh, people that have just recently completed college, that uh, the normal theater was a buck a movie and and uh, that was about the only thing they could afford at the time so there's a lot of really neat uh, memories in the theater there are, are people all throughout the community that are interested in seeing it maintained and they're getting behind it so many people have donated their time and their services the unions are helping the businesses women people have helped volunteers and uh, it just because that doesn't happen too often and this as I say, when there's unity in community, lots of things can happen, and I think that's what's happening now. Once restored, the normal theater will be a one-of-a-kind space for meetings and conferences, and a center for performing arts where community members can grow culturally. Other uses for the building beyond film would be as a, as a, as a facility for theatrical productions, live performances. Uh, music performances, whether it be uh, jazz bands, folk music, or uh, classical uh, uh, orchestral type activities. Um, a variety of children's activities we, we hope to, to sponsor in that building. Puppet shows, magicians, uh, those kinds of things. Um, our Parks and Recreation Department, for example, has indicated a use in in using the building for a variety of parks and rec programs and we've heard from just numerous ISU related groups about their interest in using the building. We're hopeful that again although the primary use of this building will be for screening films we're hopeful that it can meet a variety of other public assembly needs throughout the community and we hope that, that th there's going to be something going on there every day of the year if possible. Now 55 years old, the Normal Theater is in need of mechanical and cosmetic improvements. 
Carbondale architect Gail White has been selected to design and coordinate the restoration of the theater to its original 1930s Art Deco glory. Fundraising is now underway. This is an important time for remembering through restoration, contributing to our community, and showing your support. It is indeed time for an encore. To preserve the historic environment is to help a community keep a sense of who it is. Uh, the normal theater, that type of building, will never be built again. Uh, it's a unique part of the identity of the community. And to lose such aspects of your identity is to lose your memory. And what do we think of those who lose their memory? Mm -hmm.